Good morning, everybody. How are you? Did you enjoy the party yesterday? That, that was cool, right? I want a robot. I want a robot arm now. <laughs> My Christmas wish list is done. <laughs> so thank you very much for coming here. And double thank you for coming here even after the party. I hope you're not hungover. <laughs> hope it's not bad as, as bad as in the movies. So thank you for coming. And uh, I hope you had some very good sessions at reInvent. And I hope that you'll have some more sessions today. So who is a mobile developer here in this room? Great. Cool. How many are iOS? OK. How many are Android? Great. Kindle Fire? Not yet. Great. <laughs> cool. Thank you. So this session is about using mobile push services. We have a new service called Amazon SNS Mobile Push. And uh, we're going to walk you through a little bit on, on, on some examples. And also brought Pablo here. Pablo is going to show us what they do at Plumbee with mobile push. He's our real mobile SNS push ninja. And uh, he'll show you what they do, really cool stuff. So mobile analytics company Flurry came up with a statistic in a blog post that says that 65% of mobile applications are actually abandoned within 90 days of installation, which is not really good if you're a mobile developer, right? You're competing with so many other applications for user attention that it becomes harder and harder to actually reach your users. And so this blog post concludes with understanding and improving user engagement is the, new, the real new currency of doing business in the mobile world. So it, it's not about writing an app and getting it out. It's about engaging your customers. And one way of engaging with your customers is to use push notifications. Of course, everybody knows what push notifications are. Users opt in to receiving them, and it's make the, the operating system make it really easy to opt in. And then you can send them and have them delivered to a specific device, a specific user. And they are just like short messages, but with the option of the user tapping on them and then starting your application, bringing your application into their view, and therefore allowing you to engage with your customers more. So in this talk, we are going to see how push notifications work. We're going to learn how to, how, how to use a simple, scalable, robust, and cross-platform way of delivering push notifications. And then we are going to see a real-world example on how to send massive amounts of targeted push notifications to your customers. So let's check out what push notifications are and how they work. So on a very abstract plane, you write a cloud application running in the cloud that sends some message to your user on some mobile device. Now, in practice, there is a platform service involved. So each mobile platform, Apple's, Google Android's, Kindle's, whatever, they run a platform-specific push notification service that handles all the connections to the individual devices. And then you talk to that platform-specific service and tell the service what message you want to send where. So the platform service has all the connections to the devices. Devices register with the platform service. And they give you a token or a registration ID that you can use to target those devices. Now, the problem is it's not as easy as sending email. You need to manage those tokens. You need to do some housekeeping and interact with the platform service to get those tokens managed. So here are some challenges that come with managing push notification services. So first, we are dealing with different platform-specific services for delivering push notifications. So there is Apple APNS. There's Google GCM and Amazon ADM. And I'm sure there are others as well that are becoming more and more popular. Each of these services has different APIs, different features, different feedback mechanisms, different housekeeping to do for you. And housekeeping is something that can become complex, because as you have lots of devices to manage, you need to regularly connect to the platform service. The platform service will give you some feedback about which devices have signed off or uninstalled your application, which tokens are no longer valid, which tokens you need to refresh, uh, which 
white and blacklists to keep. And those platform services, they also manage reputation because if you don't deal well enough with those platform services, your push notifications may get into a lower priority. So it's really important to regularly connect to those platform services and do your homework. But it comes with work, right? The other thing is, the more users you get for your mobile application, the more complex all these management tasks become. Because remember, we are dealing with three different, at least three different platform services, and each of them potentially with millions of devices. So we are starting to get into a scalability problem here as we try to manage all these connections. So this is why we came up with a new service called Amazon SNS Mobile Push. So what it does, it abstracts away the complexity of handling three different push notification platforms, making it easier for you to interact with those services. So SNS Mobile Push allows you to send individual devices to individual platforms. So you can send a different message to an Apple device than you would do to a Kindle Fire device. Or you can even use platform-specific attributes that are only available on a specific service, but still interact with a single API, with a single programming model, and a more simplified model. It also allows you to send the same message to each device and be flexible there as well. You can use SNS Mobile Push for sending individual messages just for a single device, or you can use a mechanism called SNS Topics that allow you to subscribe individual endpoints into a topic, and then you send just a single message to that topic, and it gets distributed to all of the subscribers to that topic. So Amazon SNS Mobile Push handles all the complexity of housekeeping. So it manages the tokens for you, and gives you one single endpoint per mobile user that you register. And it also handles all the blacklisting, whitelisting, feedback mechanism, and, and all the, the, house, the homework that you're supposed to do without involving yourself. So you just write your messages, and you're done. So let's see how to get started. It's really easy. I'm not a mobile programmer, and I got it started. So you can do it much better than me. So let's see how, how the process works. So the first thing is. Just write your mobile application the same way you would normally do. So you can use the same libraries that your platform provider gives you and write a regular mobile application with push notifications enabled. Each platform service will give you specific credentials that you can then, that you need to, to collect in order to authenticate yourself against their services. So for APNS, you will need a push notification service SSL certificate and an application private key. For Google's GCM, you need just the API key. And for ADM, you need the, the client ID and the client secret. Then you can take these credentials and feed them into SNS Mobile Push, where you create your application in the SNS Mobile Push service. So you can do it with a simple web form, where you just register your application and put in the certificates. In this case, this is the APNS version. And then SNS knows about your application and has the right credential to act on your behalf with the platform service. So when your mobile users start your application for the first time, the mobile application will register with the platform service. And in return, it will get a device token or a registration ID. So this is the ID that identifies the user on this app, on this specific device, to the platform-specific service. So you need to program the application in a way that this token gets sent to your cloud application so that you know that you have a new user that registered already. And then you can give that token to SNS Mobile Push so that Mobile Push knows about the new device. And it'll give you an ARN back, an Amazon resource name, which is your Mobile Push address, if you will. And after that, you're all set because then you can use the SNS API to create new devices, to, to um, register your devices, and start sending messages. So the next step is actually to send the message. You can either do it from the console, or you can write some code. In this case, this is some Python code, and uh, this is how to do it in, in, in Python. Who likes Python? Just a few show hands, OK. 
Who prefers Java? Okay, we have you both covered, don't worry. And I'm not a Ruby guy, but I'm sure it is as easy as, as, as this in Ruby as well. So that's it. After this, you just need to receive, or your users receive their push notification, and you're all set. Now, you still need to manage your devices, though. That means we have now made it much easier to interact with the platform-specific services because you don't have to do the housekeeping and you have now a single API, a single way of sending messages across three different platforms, but you will have all these ARNs and need to find a way to manage these. So you can use the SNS mobile push API to discover what devices are, are, are there by using the, the list endpoint by platform application call, or you can manage your ARNs in a database. And we would suggest using DynamoDB because it's, it's really easy to use. It is a great key value store. You can do a, a, a lot of complex things without having to set up the database. And then you can start pushing, uh, publishing to individual ARNs, or you can use services like SQS or Simple Workflow Service to handle the management of many, 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 many messages across all your users and manage mass delivery of push notifications. So let's have a quick demo so that you can see how it works in practice. Let me log in real quick and then I'll show you how it works. Great. So this is the AWS console and I've navigated already to the SNS dashboard. In the SNS version of the console, you can register your applications. In this case, I have two applications registered. One is using ADM, which is the Kindle Fire service, and the other one is using Apple's APNS. And uh, so this is where you register your applications, and after registering an application, you get an Amazon resource name, which is this one here, that allows you to identify your application. So after you registered your application, you start subscribing or you start registering tokens. So in this case, this is my mobile phone that is registered over here. So yeah, let's send a message to my mobile phone. So I have my mobile phone here and um, we can start sending messages right away. So you just hit the publish button. You can either send a generic message here or you can use the platform specific version, which is a little bit more enriched. So in, in the Apple world, for instance, I can add an extra piece of code that will allow me to hear a tone when the new push notification came in. So let's say, and add some platform specific stuff to the picture. So I hope I did everything right. So let's publish the message. And I now have my camera here so that we can see if it actually works. So these are the demo moments where we hope that everything works. And let's see if I got it right, yeah. Sometimes it could take, take a few seconds. So let's unlock the phone and see where it works. Here it is. Oh, that, that's the wrong message, so. <laughs> <laughs> okay, let's try again, so. Don't worry, we have many ways of using this. Yeah, sometimes queuing up takes a, a couple of seconds, so don't worry. So well, let's wait here. Okay, so while we are waiting, we have a different way of using this service because in my case, I also wrote my own application here. So this is the application that I wrote and I implemented a pushback service. Let's see if that works better. So this application will, when I push this button here, will call my own application, which is a Flask application running on Elastic Beanstalk, and it will push back. It's kind of like an echo service. So let's see if that works better, because maybe I just mispushed. So this sent the push successfully, and let's see whether I get a pushback. I programmed it to delay it by 10 seconds, and then we can see if I get some pushback, so. 
Okay, we have a classic demo moment here, people. <laughs> Great. Okay, but don't worry, I have three different ways of using it. Oh, now it worked. It worked. Hey, here it is. So it says message received. Thank you. So just to show you that it's real and not, not something fake, here is my application that I put together using Flask and, and Python. It's an Elastic Beanstalk application, really easy to, to use. And in this case, I have a web form that basically does the same. So I, I see this is the list of endpoints that are registered, and I can select between Kindle and an iPhone. So let's try again. Hello from the web. And then we can see whether this works better. I want, I want to hear the tone, you know? So this, there it is, including the tone. Great. Now let's try Kindle, because now I'm getting really brave. Yesterday I finished my Kindle application, so this is all rocket technology. So let's try the Kindle version of the same thing, so, that, so you know it works on different devices. So let's say, hello, Kindle Fire, and push to that. Okay, so this is my Kindle, and let's switch it on and unlock it. So in this case, you, you will notice here this little bubble over there, which tells me that there is a new notification. There is one from Gmail, and there's another one from my application. No, we don't want to read Gmail right now, but we want to read this other one, so here it is. So this is where we where the Hello Kindle Fire message came in, over there on the bottom. Okay, so it's really easy. Just to show you how easy it is in code, let's do it one more time using some real code, and then we can have a look at how the API works. So here I'm going to use Python, but of course you can use any other language you like. In Python we have a library called Boto, which is a great way of, of accessing the AWS API. And there is a boto.sns object uh, library that I, I can import. So the first thing is we need to connect to the SNS service. And since I'm from Germany, I'm going to connect to the Dublin region. So here we are. And now I can see all the API calls that I have here. Um, just to make it a bit easier for you, I'm gonna highlight this call. So this call here, this platform applications, allows you to query SNS what applications have been registered with the service. So let's try this one out. So I get a list back with the ARNs for the application, and you will notice that we have two applications here. One is this one, which is the ADM application that I registered with SNS, and the other one is this other one over here, which is the iPhone version. In the iPhone case, we have two different application types. One is the sandbox application type, which is for testing, and the other one is the real APNS. So you can have different groups of devices, uh, one for testing Apple devices and one for the real world. So sending a, 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 so discovering devices is as easy as this. So I can just say SNS, and then the next call we would need would be um, list endpoints. This is over here by platform application. So we just copy paste it here, and then give it the ARN for our application. In this case, it's this one. And I get a list back with all the devices that registered for this specific application that, that I set up there. So it, in the iPhone world, we get tokens. So this is the token for my mobile phone. And each device gets their own ARN that I can now use to send a message to. So let's do that.
and I get an OK message from the service. And if everything goes well, then I should be having another message over here. Uh, it'll take some seconds. Anyway. So that, that was the demo. This is how easy it is to do it in code. I did my first iOS application literally a week ago, and it took me like a, an afternoon. I know it's 80% copy-paste, but if I can do it, you can do it very easily as well. Okay, so let's recap how it works. So SNS Mobile Push allows you to do a cross-platform push to Apple, Google, and Amazon devices. And the good thing here is it scales seamlessly. It's no matter how many devices you have, you will always be able to reach all of them. We take care of the scalability. There may, you, you're seeing there may be some lag, but your notification will eventually be, be delivered. It makes token management much easier. You get one ARN per mobile user, independently whether it's an Apple user or an Android user or a Kindle Fire user. And then you can use those ARNs just like you would an email address for sending push notifications. The first one million pushes are free per month, and each million thereafter is only one dollar. So it's a really, really cost-effective service because the alternative would be that you would need to set up your own fleet of machines that handle all the, the, the uh, homework stuff that you need to do with the platform provider. So one dollar per million is a pretty good price. OK, let's look at a much more sophisticated example. So I'd like to introduce you to Pablo Varela. He is a software engineer with Plumby, a company from the UK. So thank you. Thanks, Pablo. So hello, everyone. Thanks for coming, especially after the party yesterday. I'm impressed so many people made it here. Um, so uh, my name is Pablo Varela. I come from Plan B. Uh, like many of you here, uh, I've been working on Amazon Web, Amazon Web Services for quite a long time now. In my case, I was building backend services for almost four years uh, using exclusively Amazon Web Services. Today, I'm going to tell you um, how we used SNS and other, and other uh, AWS um, staff uh, to, to give the ability to our customer support teams, product managers, um, and CRM teams, um, to give them the ability to send fine rent push notifications to, to our customers using any metric available in our analytics system. So before that, I... I will explain you a little bit about Plan B and our use case for push notifications. Okay, so what does Plan B do? Uh, we are a social digital casino company. What we do is casino games. So you're probably, if you weren't familiar before, you're probably quite familiar now with these machines. It's impossible to, to, to avoid them around here. So uh, we build high quality um, slot machines. Uh, that they, have, they have all the common features like bonus rounds and free spins and so on. Uh, these are just some examples of our mobile application. What you won't see uh, in the machines and these casinos is uh, a game feature we call challenges. Challenges are extremely important for our users because they turn non-winning spins into winning spins. How they work is they're in a challenge period that it ranks for a short period of time between one and 10 days. You get the chance of get this overlay with symbols that start spinning. And if they match, you get a number of symbols that go against a milestone. And then you can get something we call mirror balls. And at the end of the challenge period, you can transform that into coins you can use to play the game, right? So this feature is really important for our users because it increases the RTP of the slot machine. So they can play more and it's been more frequently. So there are three key dates for these challenges. When the challenge starts, so you can start collecting symbols. When the challenge ends, so you can just keep collecting to reach a milestone and get mirror balls that then you can use to spin more. And what we call the redemption period. The redemption period is when you can get these mirror balls and get actual coins from them, right? So this is all fine and well. And we started to get some customer support tickets asking us to 
please notify our users about when challenges are starting. This is very good because, first of all, we didn't expect this to happen. Our, our users are asking us to what I personally consider spam normally from, from, from games, right? So this was very good. So we thought, okay, so we can, we can send notifications when the challenge starts, we can do it when the challenge ends, and also during the redemption period. And that, that was the initial plan. But then marketing joined the conversation, and they asked for all this stuff. So they were like, oh, okay, so what if we use this for increased retention, user reactivation, target users by different categories of spenders, all this kind of crazy stuff, right? So the problem changed a little bit. So what we wanted to do was to enable our teams, especially marketing, CRM, product managers, to have an easy way to, to set up campaigns. So ideally what we wanted them to do is to just know which message they want to send, when they want to send it, and the target audience. Right? And that is it. Also, we're growing quite a lot when now we mobile, that we were planning to use this tool not just for mobile, but also for messages in social networks and so on. And we didn't want to worry about managing high volume of data to send push notifications. So these are the three main building blocks of data collection, targeting, and mobile push. In order to understand why our solution works for us, it's important to understand how we collect and how we transform data and get good analytics from it. Uh, the solution I'm going to, to present here, it works for us because of how we manage our data. It might not work for you, but this, this is the way we do it. So for data collection, you sometimes you start thinking about which business metrics you need. Um, then you collect different types of data depending on, on on, on, on the business metrics you need at the end. We decided to collect everything. We're very data hungry and data driven as well. So we collect absolutely everything. Any user action uh, is, is collected. So we are here in this great area between also monitoring and, and, and business intelligence and so on. So we collect even database accesses, uh, API calls, absolutely everything. We just put it there. Whether we didn't need it or, or, or not now is not relevant for us. Maybe we'll need it in the future. We, we can go back and we can backfill uh, all our data, right? So we collect everything. So if you collect the, uh, enough data and you have a strong analytics team, then your targeting will be much more effective. So data collection starts in the user device for us. As I said before, any action is going to hit one of our services, right? The service is not relevant here. We have a service-oriented architecture. Depending on what you are doing, you will target one service or another service. The services will call other services as well. But no matter what, any action uh, will be logged to uh, our analytics queues. We use SQS for that. We have at least one queue per application, per platform, right? One of the events we collect that gives me the opportunity to explain you how we also do um, registration, device regi registration, is exactly that one, device registration. So once, once the client has registered uh, with the platform provider, uh, it will do a call to our registration service, and it will trigger this code. This is Java code. I know your Python fans here, but <laughs> it's the Java SDK. If you're familiar with the Java SDK, uh, this, is very, this is straightforward, right? It's like all the Amazon Java SDKs are extremely simple to use. You have this request object with fluid notation, and then the client just performs the action for you. The beauty of this code is that it doesn't change if you use a different provider. So we're actually using this for iPhone, and iPads, and general Apple products, uh, but we're working now on Android, and we don't have to modify this code. We actually integrated with Amazon recently, and we use exactly the same piece of code. After you have your device endpoint, uh, we we'll lock everything to SQS. So here, we're building an object that represents the action that was performed, 
the SQS logger you see there is not actually uh, the Amazon SQS client. It's an internal client we use to batch requests. We do that because you pay per call. So we batch request, we do a batch uh, write in SQS, and we cut our build like by 10 or something. Uh, it's, it's, it's a very good way to do it. And this is the actual event that makes it to the queue. The content is not relevant, but we just use, use JSON. And, but you can see there the endpoint uh, for the application. OK. So now we have all this data in, in our queues, and we have to archive it somehow. So what we do, what you see in Apache Flume, if you are, is anyone else using it here? Are you familiar with it? Yeah, no? Some people here? So Flume is very good to move data stream flows from one place to the other and do some relatively simple transformations to the data. So uh, we implemented our own SQS consumer. There wasn't any available. We're planning to open source it. I don't believe it is open sourced yet, but it will be probably in, <laughs> in the coming months. So Apache Flume uh, consumes from SQS. Uh, it partitions the data, and we store it in S3. The partitioning we do at this, at this point is very simple. We do it by date, and we do it by event type. Now you have your data archived. Now you have to do something clever with your data. We use Hadoop to consume and transform the data. So Elastic. And of course, we use Elastic Map Reviews for this. Um, so our analytics team, they run daily ETLs against this data we're collecting continuously. And they do some clever stuff with it. Uh, among them, they generate KPIs that have business metrics that go to all the teams. So we know on a daily basis what's going on with the product, something is wrong, so on. We also send some data to Amazon, Redshift, and you'll see later how this, how this fits in the whole picture. This is what we actually use for push notifications. Uh, actually, the endpoint makes it there as well. And then we do some other aggregations uh, that we store somewhere else in S3 uh, for other systems to consume, like Hive, for example for some ad hoc queries that some teams want. OK, so now we have all these user actions. Somehow, we archive all this data. We get some business metrics, and we put it, we have them in Redshift, right? So the user targeting problem becomes as simple as running SQL queries. And that is what we do. We run SQL queries against Redshift. So I have seen, uh, here some lame examples that we use them for testing and everything, but we asked our teams, product managers, marketing, to learn SQL, and they did. They did learn SQL. So when they want to launch a campaign, uh, they just wrote a SQL query, they put it in the system. This, for example, will target all the users. This one targets lapsed users. We do this with lapsed vendors or anything. This one is a bit more tricky. In this one, what we're doing is we get a, a, a week, and we split it in buckets of three hours. So we have 50, 56 buckets. And what we do is we analyze user behavior. We know when the users are active, and we assign each user a different time slice. So when we're targeting them, we're doing it when we believe that the notification is going to be more effective. Right? But these are just some examples. You can do any crazy stuff using any metric that you have. And the better your analytics, the more fine-grained your, your targeting is. So the last building block is the mobile push. You probably guessed that what we use here is SNS. Otherwise, I wouldn't be here talking about this. And that is what we do, yes, yes. So Constantine already covered this very, very well. Uh, this is the code, Java code for the push. No secrets here, straightforward. It works the same for all the platforms. Once again, we are live in iPhone, uh, but with, the, with Android, we didn't have to modify the code. If you see the payload, we're using a default option. So 
And then we have another field, which is APNS. So APNS uses the proprietary format of Apple. So you have to do something like enable sounds. You have just this sound field, and then you get this, this sound when identification arrives. But if you target any other platform, then you will get whatever you have in default, which is just a plain message uh, with nothing else. If we want to do something more funky with Android, so setting backgrounds, sounds, and so on, we just come here, modify the template, and that is it. But we don't have to touch any other, any other part of the whole architecture. So we're using a, quite a lot of variety of services here. Um, we have red, all our data in Redshift, use SNS for mobile push and so on. How, we, how do we orchestrate the whole thing? We use import workflow for this. And this is how it works. So let's say you're a good product manager, you, you learn SQL, and now you want to start a campaign. Let's say you want to target certain type of spenders. Um, you know when you want to send it, and you, want, you know the kind of message you want to send. So what you do is you go to our published service, and you set it up. So what I'm calling here published service is actually a command line tool. It's a jar file that accepts three parameters. The only thing you need to run this is a scheduler. You could use anything. You could use a, you could use a current job if you want. We happen to use CloudBeast. We use Jenkins for this because uh, all our teams are used to it. They know how to use it. They are comfortable with it. So our product managers and marketing, they go to Jenkins, they create a job, they, they schedule it, they set up the message, and, and they set up uh, the query that represents the, the audience that they want to target. When the scheduler executes uh, the job, uh, it starts a workflow execution against Amazon Simple Workflow. In Simple Workflow, we have two workflows for this particular service. We have a high-level one we call uh, the bootstrap. What it does uh, is it executes the SQL query provided by the user against Redshift. The Redshift also allows you to very, very easily uh, upload your data to Amazon S3. You can wrap your query with unload, and you will upload your data to S3. Just have to specify the bucket. So use a different bucket per campaign. Um, the number of files that are uploaded to S3, it changes quite a lot. It depends on how many machines you have in your Redshift cluster, the number of CPUs in those machines, and the and data volume you have, and so on. Um, but let's say you have just one file of one million users that you're going to target. You want to be able to process those users in parallel. You don't want to go sequentially through the whole file, because that would take quite a long time, especially if you have millions of users. So we also instruct Redshift to use a fixed column width, so we know exactly how much space a user um, um, yeah, how many bytes you have per user in the file, right? So we can start a number of children workflows that process those users. So let's say again that we have one million users, and we start one, 100 children batch processors. So each one of them will process 10,000 users. And so they start reading uh, from the S3 partition. Uh, we, we actually don't read everything sequentially here. But we, we read sequentially, but not the whole batch. Uh, we establish a, a batch size. Um, so let's say it is 1,000. So each one of these workers will perform 10 reads against Redshift. And then they will send uh, all that, they will publish the whole batch against uh, SNS in parallel. So in, in this example, you will be sending 100,000 mobile push uh, simultaneously, right? So yeah, so at the end, uh, you publish, and, and the message will make it to the device. When the process finishes, uh, each one of the children reports back to the bootstrap workflow, 
and with some metrics about what, what actually happened. How many messages were sent, how many endpoints were disabled because the user uninstalled the app or something like that, and how many unknown errors we have. And then we generate a report that we send to our teams as well. So this is some example, it's a template. Yeah, but here we know how many devices we targeted, how long it took to execute, uh, what was the targeting query, um, errors, and so on, which include a link that to Simple Workflow Console, so you can there and see more in depth what actually happened. So we didn't have this running for a long time now, but we ran it every day. And at the time we was putting this presentation together, we, we just had run one campaign. Uh, so we wanted to have some data and some nice graph to show you guys. And this is what I have. So if you remember, uh, our challenges feature has three key days. The day uh, the challenge starts, the last day of the challenge, and the redemption day. So what we did is to send notifications to our customers in those exact dates. And we compared the D2 retention. This is not a classical D2 retention. You normally use install date for this. Uh, for this particular experiment, uh, what we used was if you play the day before, you're still playing today, or at the end, at the end of today. So day one is like day one, so it would be day zero, day one, final day, minus one, final day, and so on. So in blue, you have our D2 retention without push notifications and in orange with push notifications. So even though I don't have any numbers there because I wasn't allowed to because D2 is like very key for our business or, or something like that, um, the difference in magnitude is real. This actually happened. And still early days, we're still collecting more data. We're adding quite a lot of new metrics for this, uh, but it looks promising so far. So it looks like this actually has an impact in, in, in user engagement. And that is it. So to, to summarize, you use quite, with a bunch of technologies here. It's, this is a bit much more than just SNS. They, we wanted to explain to you how we use SNS and what we built around it to make something that is useful for, for our business. So we collect and analyze data using a lot of Amazon services, SQS, S3, EMR, Redshift, Flume, and Flume is not Amazon, but we use it anyway. Um, yeah, that's interesting because in the keynote there is no streaming service very similar to this one. It will be good to, to look at it and see what we can do with it. We'll probably replace Flume. And the targeting, which sounds like a very complex problem, uh, we turn it into a trivial problem to solve. We have all this data, our analytics team is brilliant. Uh, they just generate very good uh, key metrics for us, so we can just query them. That is it. Uh, mobile push with SNS, and we orchestrate the whole thing with simple workflow. So if you want more information about the projects we're running, we have uh, some open source projects. Uh, we have an engineering blog as well, and you can contact me directly uh, via email if you have any questions. Um, both uh, the GitHub account and engineering blog, they are quite recent. There is not too much stuff there, but we'll be putting more and more stuff over time. Okay? So thank you very much. Thank you, Pablo. Okay, I hope you have everything now that you need to get started with Amazon SNS Mobile Push. We have SDKs for just about every language that you may prefer. If you're missing a language, you can still program against the raw RESTful API. And we also have integration with different IDEs, so we hope that it makes it very easy for you to get started right away. If you are looking for more information, I would encourage you to go to the Amazon SNS detail page. You will find the documentations there. You will find some sample code. and Again, it's really easy to get started. And of course, if you have feedback, we would welcome your feedback to this email address, AWS SNS Mobile Push at Amazon.com. And we sincerely hope that your application will never get abandoned, and we hope that we can help you with that with SNS Mobile Push. So I think we have some time for questions, or feel free to find me 
after the, the talk. My name is Konstantin Gonzalez, and I'll be happy to show you some code or answer your questions. And of course, Pablo is here as well to help you understand what they do at Plumbee. So thank you very much for coming, and enjoy your last day at reInvent. Thanks.